Hey up viewers and viewers, my name is General Red Stratist and welcome to another little indie horror game. Halloween is approaching us and you know what that means. It's time for at least, you know, for me to do at least a couple of uh, horror games to mark the occasion. This one is Dagon, ladies and gents. Now, those of you who know a little bit of HP Lovecraft will probably recognise that name straight away. Dagon, of course, was a uh, short story that Lovecraft himself wrote back in the 1920s whenever it was, which was uh, about horror at sea, a guy who's washed up on a strange island where he witnesses something very sinister. So apparently this game is um, pretty much a um, kind of retelling uh, of that story, or a telling rather of that story, uh, in a video game medium. Uh, apparently it's a bit of a walking sim, but um, it has decent ratings, and uh, although only short, um, I'm guessing it's only probably about half an hour long, something like that, from at least from looking at some of the reviews people have left. Uh, but it is free. You don't have to pay uh, anything for this game. So, hey, might as well play it. You know me. I do like my HP Lovecraft stories. I've played a few uh, Lovecraftian games before here on the channel. Call of Cthulhu, Dark Corners of the Earth, Canarium. And there's that Cats of Ulthar one, actually, that I played back in June or July, was it? Remember that one? So, yeah, um, we're going to take a look at this and we're going to see how it is. Now, hopefully the sound is good. Also, I just noticed uh, on the kind of right there, they've actually got DLCs for this. I did look at these on the store page. Um, mainly, they don't really add anything particular special uh, to this game. They're just like optional extras, like uh, I think artworks and soundtracks and stuff. Tales of Herring Lake, though, I don't know what that is. Maybe I'll have to check that out on Steam. Maybe if that's a uh, interesting horror game. All right, enough guessing from me. Let's go. Dagon is a faithful interactive adaptation of H.P. Lovecraft's work, focused on story and atmosphere. You will not find difficult choices, action sequences, or inventory management here, and movement is limited to progressing through locations along with the plot. So, I have a feeling this is going to be like games, um, well, akin to games like Dear Esther. Do you remember Dear Esther, that one? Which is basically a game of completely limited functionality. You essentially just wandered across a uh, map listening to the story. I have a feeling it's going to be like that. I am Let's writing this under an appreciable mental strain, since by tonight I shall be no more. Oh, interesting. So is it literally just going to be a telling of the story? Oh, during the game you'll encounter interactive elements. Some of them will allow you to continue your journey. Others reveal interesting facts about the original short story, its historical background, and the author. Some of the trivia is hidden. In order to find these signs, focus your eyes and look for the elder sign, which looks basically like a... Uh, like a tree thing. <laughs> you can also access all the found facts later. They will be available in the main menu. Okay, yeah, we did see an option in the main menu for trivia. Right, so we're looking for like circles, question marks, things like that, and then the tree icons. All right, so it's probably something around here. That, namely. Penniless, and at the end of my supply of the drug which alone makes life endurable, I can bear the torture no longer and shall cast myself from this garret window into the squalid street below. Graphics are pretty good though, aren't they? I mean, look at this. We can only turn around so far by the looks of it, but... Yeah, it looks, looks good enough at the moment. All right. Oh. Do not think from my slavery to morphine that I am a weakling or a degenerate. Oh, the window's there. We're now looking at the table, I guess. When you have read these hastily scrawled pages, you may guess though never fully realise why it is that I must have forgetfulness or death. That's a common Lovecraftian theme, the idea of uh, people witnessing terrible things that basically drive them insane. And so it's like they either want to destroy their memories or more easily just kill themselves because of the horrors that lie beyond the earth. <laughs> Alright, is there something we could... Oh, there's a couple of things. Oh, is that a trivia thing? Morphine. Entered into use in the 19th century and was routinely administered to treat severe pain during the American Civil War and World War I. It was also sold without restrictions until 1914. Uh, it became more popular after the invention of the hypodermic syringe around 1854. Friedrich Saturna, who first isolated the substance, originally named it Morphium, after Morpheus, the Greek god associated with dreams. At the time when Dagon was published, morphine abuse, known as soldier's disease, already posed a big problem in the US. Yes. Okay, so we're going to get little bits of trivia and things like that. Getting a bit of a history lesson in this one, too. I like the narrator's voice. Sounds pretty good. All right, ah, here we go. It was in one of the most open and least frequented parts of the broad Pacific that the packet of which I was supercargo Ooh. fell a victim to the German Sea Raider. I mean, that looks more like a modern ship than a World War One era vessel, but okay. <laughs> I mean, I guess, actually, I haven't said that. I don't know. Maybe ships back in the day did have superstructures like that. It just looks more like a freaking 
modern, I don't know, cargo, bulk carrier than a World War One vessel. That one over there looks more like a World War One sort of ship. Can we walk around? Uh, no, not yet, but we can examine the ship over there. Oh, is that supposed to be the German Sea Raider? I doubt it. Oh, maybe. Maybe not. Maybe, the maybe not. The Great War was then at its very beginning, and the ocean forces of the Hun had not completely ah. sunk to their later degradation. Okay, we're on the German ship now, it appears. Interesting. So that our vessel was made a legitimate prize, whilst we of her crew were treated with all the fairness and consideration due us as naval prisoners. Interesting. I'm wondering if we can... I don't think we can actually move around. Maybe it's... Um, I could have sworn it said it was kind of like a walking sim, which implied you could sort of wander around your environments, but maybe not. Right, there's, um... Ah! Here we go, some trivia. The Huns. The Huns were Central Asian nomads who established a dominion in Europe and invaded the Roman Empire in the 5th century AD. They were known as brutal, deadly warriors and masters of quick raids who also developed powerful composite bows, lassoes, and early siege weapons. During World War I, the British used the word Hun as a synonym for Germans in order to emphasize their brutality. However, the term originated when the German Emperor Wilhelm II gave a speech to his troops on 27th of July 1900 before they embarked in China. Should you encounter the enemy, he will be defeated. No quarter will be given. Prisoners will not be taken. Whoever falls into your hands is forfeited. Just as a thousand years ago, the Huns under their King Attila made a name for themselves, one that even today makes them seem mighty in history and legend. May the name German be affirmed by you in such a way in China that no Chinese will ever again dare to look cross-eyed at a German. The refusal to take prisoners was a clear breach of the laws and customs of war adopted during the first Hague Convention of 1899. More history. There you go. <laughs> Lifeboat. Oh, oh, we are walking now. It's a bit more like a point-and-click type thing. So ah. liberal, indeed, was the discipline of our captors, that five days after we were taken, I managed to escape alone, in a small boat, with water and provisions for a good length of time. Okay. These are the provisions over here. Let's check there's nothing else that we can look at. It doesn't look like there is. Okay. We're in the boat now, I guess. When I finally ah, found myself unlocked. adrift and free, I had but little idea of my surroundings. Solitude in a broken blue. Okay, well, we're just drifting now, I guess. At some point, we're going to come across the island. Never a competent navigator. I could only guess vaguely by the sun and stars that I was somewhat south of the equator. Can we look at any of the stars? That's a good of question. Of the longitude, I knew nothing, and no island or coastline was in sight. Oh, you're going to encounter something pretty bad, mate. Oh. Right, we can look at something, I'm guessing. Ah, that over there. Is there anything else? It's not going to ask me to look at any stars or anything, is it? No. All right, sail towards the light. The weather kept fair, and for uncounted days I drifted aimlessly beneath the scorching sun, waiting either for some passing ship or to be cast on the shores of some habitable land. Okay. Yeah, um, oh, we can look at that. Anything else? No? God, I like the sound design, though. You can hear, yeah, seagulls off in the distance. Which means we're approaching but land. But neither ship nor land appeared. Oh no, and you're going to see something soon. In my solitude upon the heaving vastness of unbroken blue. <laughs> Just an endless blueness. It's coming, mate, the don't you worry. happened whilst I slept. Here we go. You're going to land on a strange shoreline. Its details I shall never know. For my slumber, though troubled and dream infested, was continuous. Oh God. <laughs> Jesus. Well, I can't say I was expecting uh, bloody squid... Old Squiddo here to friggin' greet me. Well, you're not looking uh, very good, are you, either? You're a bit stuck in these bloody mud flats. Well, there's my boat. Okay, welcome to the island where we're going to encounter Dagon, ladies and gents. When at last I awoke, it was to discover myself half sucked into a slimy expanse of hellish black mire, which extended about me in monotonous undulations as far as I could see. Decent graphics, though. They've really put a lot into the art there. And in which my boat lay grounded some distance away. Though one might well imagine that my first sensation would be of wonder, at so prodigious and unexpected a transformation of scenery, I was in reality more horrified than astonished. 
Well, who wouldn't be if you freaking landed on your on a bloody island and this was what greeted you? For there was in the air and in the rotting soil a sinister quality which chilled me to the very core. I mean, I don't remember there being bloody squids like this in the story. I think this is, you know, the game devs taking a bit of liberty with the uh, with what they're creating, which is fine. The region was putrid with the carcasses of decaying fish and of other less describable things which I saw protruding from the nasty mud of the unending plain. Okay, well, they said fish. These are technically cephalopods, but... Jesus. Okay. Perhaps I should not hope to convey in mere words the unutterable hideousness that can dwell in absolute silence and barren immensity. There was nothing within hearing and nothing in sight save a vast reach of black slime. Yet the very completeness of the stillness and the homogeneity of the landscape oppressed me with a nauseating fear. The sun was blazing down from a sky which seemed to me almost black in its cloudless cruelty, as though reflecting the inky marsh beneath my feet. God, he's a good voice actor though. I like it. Oh yeah, there's the sun over there. And the darkness of the sky. Okay. Now we can examine the boat. Anything else? Any squidsies, maybe? Dead fish? Anything else you want me to look at? No, you want me to look at the boat? Okay. Oh, God, that squelching noise. <laughs> I'm in the mire. As I crawled into the stranded boat, I realised that only one theory could explain my position. Through some unprecedented volcanic upheaval, a portion of the ocean floor must have been thrown to the surface exposing regions for which innumerable millions of years had lain hidden under unfathomable watery depths. Is that a fucking trilobite or something? Or is it supposed to be like one of those giant isopods? Ah, I'm not sure. One or the other. For a second I looked at it and thought, trilobite, just because of some of the... well, just the, like the general shape, but having said that, I can't really tell. Maybe it is supposed to be a trilobite. Because the thing is, there's like a nautilus there. Yeah, maybe it is, because that would kind of fit, wouldn't it, with the sort of Lovecraftian theme of ancient monstrosities. So great was the extent of the new land which had risen beneath me that I could not detect the faintest noise of the surging ocean, straining my ears as I might. Oh, I don't like that over there, the way that's pulsing. Jesus, look, it's alive. Who even is that? It's like a big creature. Nor were there any sea fowl to prey upon the dead things. It's probably because something's been preying on them. Alright, what are we clicking next? The dead fish? Is there anything else? Yeah, not that I see anything. Eat the For fish. several <laughs> hours I sat thinking or brooding in the boat, which lay upon its side and afforded a slight shade as the sun moved across the heavens. As the day progressed, the ground lost some of its stickiness and seemed likely to dry sufficiently for travelling purposes in a short time. That All night right. I slept but little, and the next day I made for myself a pack containing food and water, preparatory to an overland journey in search of the vanished sea and possible rescue. Oh, you're going to encounter some uh, pretty freaky shit, bud. Brace yourself. Oh right, oh, right, there's the pack there. Anything else we can look at? Not by the looks of it, no. Just got to get that. On the third morning, I found the soil dry enough to walk upon with ease. The odour of the fish was maddening, but I was too much concerned with graver things to mind so slight an evil, and set out boldly for an unknown goal. Would you go wandering across this landscape, ladies and gentlemen? This dark and sinister landscape? Oh, right. Well, I guess we're walking off towards the horizon. Anything else we can look at? <laughs> A fish that's just upright in the mud there. <laughs> this big... What's kind of golden looking squid thing? Huh. How weird. I feel like some of these might not be real fish. Or real dead carcasses. I feel like we might have encountered something. <laughs> Alright, well, we're walking again. Oh. All day I forged steadily westward, guided by a faraway hummock which rose higher than any other elevation on the rolling desert. That over there. Well, these look more like bones than anything else. I guess we're going over there. Can we look at anything? Any trivia? Because we've only had a couple of things. God, I love that texture on that muddy ground, though. Looks real good. God, 
how many provisions have you got? Wow, that's a big freaking dead whale. Good lord. Jesus. Well, we're just going towards the little hillock, I guess. That <laughs> night, I encamped, and on the following day still travelled toward the hummock, though that Potter, object sorry. seemed scarcely nearer than when I had first espied it. Yeah, if I remember correctly, I don't think it's uh, it's a hummock. I think it's uh, something horrible that you're wandering towards, which you don't want to go near, if I remember correctly. All right, we can keep going over towards it. Oh, hello, there's trivia here. What's this? The horrors of the ocean. The creator of the Cthulhu mythos and the fictional underwater city of Rilaire, Rilaire, however it was pronounced, was convinced that life could not exist at the bottom of the ocean because the water pressure would make it un... Uh, I just say uninhabitable, not unhabitable, but unless that well, is that a correct word? I don't know. Today we know that the darkest depths of the ocean are home to many peculiar organisms. The deepest dwelling fish we have discovered so far, the Mariana snailfish, can live about 8,000 metres, more than 26,000 feet, below the ocean's surface, in never-ending darkness and at hellishly crushing pressures, hundreds of times stronger than those found at sea level. Upon glancing at the modern photos of deep sea creatures such as the anglefish, the fangtooth or the viperfish, and their truly Lovecraftian characteristics, it's hard not to find some irony in this. <laughs> True. There's some freaky shit at the bottom of the ocean, at the deepest points. I've always found the ocean fascinating, scary and fascinating in equal measure. I love the ocean. It's a great setting for horror. Oh god. Dagon, are you there? By the fourth evening, I attained the base of the mound which turned out to be much higher than it had appeared from a distance. They've got atmosphere. I'll give them that. I love the fuck yeah, just the graphics are gone, that lighting though. It looks so good. An intervening valley setting it out in sharper relief from the general surface. Too weary to ascend, I slept in the shadow of the hill. And you're gonna see I some horrible not shit. Why my dreams were so wild that night. Yeah, that's another Lovecraftian theme that is very typical. Dreaming. Especially when you're in proximity to weird shit from... <laughs> from preternatural ages. But ere the waning and fantastically gibbous moon had risen far above the eastern plain. God, I love that narrator's voice. I was voice. awake in a cold perspiration, determined to sleep no more. Oh, that lighting, though. It looks so good. Such visions as I had experienced were too much for me to endure again. And in the glow of the moon I saw how unwise I had been to travel by day. Without the glare oh. of the parching sun, my journey would have cost me less energy. Indeed, I now felt quite able to perform the ascent which had deterred me at sunset. Picking up my pack, I started for the crest of the eminence. Well, probably. It wants us to click somewhere on the hummock, right? I think. No, or click our pack. Well, it doesn't look like we can see anything else, so let's do it. I have said that the unbroken monotony of the rolling plane was a source of vague horror to me. I guess a kind of existential horror, in a sense. But I think my horror was greater when I gained the summit of the mound and looked down the other side into an immeasurable pit or canyon. Well, let's have a look whose black recesses the moon had not yet soared high enough to illumine. Oh god, just the precipice, okay. I felt myself on the edge of the world. Well, you're on the edge of the world that you know, mate. You're about to gaze into horrible, untold fathoms of nightmarish entities. Peering over the rim into a fathomless chaos of eternal night. Through my terror ran curious reminiscences of Paradise Lost and of Satan's hideous climb through the unfashioned realms of darkness. As the moon climbed higher in the sky, I began to see that the slopes of the valley were not quite so perpendicular as I had imagined. Okay, we're going down by the looks of it. Oh boy. Ledges and outcroppings of rock afforded fairly easy footholds for a descent. You don't want to go down there, my friend. Whilst after a drop of only a few hundred feet, the declivity became very gradual. We're going down. <laughs> We're going down into the darkness. Oh boy. When's Dagon going to show up? Urged on by an impulse which I cannot definitely analyse. I scrambled with difficulty down the rocks and stood on the gentler slope beneath. 
Oh god. It's been a while since I read the story. Gazing into the Stygian deeps, where no light had yet penetrated. I guess this is just a word-for-word -word retelling of the uh, story, then. All at once, my attention was captured oh. by a vast and singular object on the opposite slope, which rose steeply about a hundred yards ahead of me. An object that gleamed whitely in the newly bestowed rays of the ascending moon. Well, I guess we're moving on. Is there anything else I can look at before I do? Not by the looks of it. Oh boy. We're getting closer. That it was merely a gigantic piece of stone, I soon assured myself. <laughs> Not a natural piece of stone, though, by the looks of it. I methinks that's been left by some eldritch civilization, old boy. But I was conscious of a distinct impression yeah, that its contour exactly. and position were not altogether the work of nature. A closer scrutiny filled me with sensations I cannot express. We're going towards it, we're getting closer. Dagon is nearby. For despite its enormous magnitude, and its position in an abyss which had yawned at the bottom of the sea since the world was young, I perceived beyond a doubt that the strange object was a well-shaped monolith, whose massive bulk had known the workmanship and perhaps the worship of living and thinking creatures. Inhuman creatures. Dazed and frightened, yet not without a certain thrill of the scientist's or archaeologist's delight, I examined my surroundings more closely. Why are you telling me to look at my surroundings? Was that there? Is there anything else? No? Alright. Just the one thing. He's going to appear at some point. Oh god. The moon, now near the zenith, Whoa. shone weirdly and vividly above the towering steeps that hemmed in the chasm, and revealed the fact that a far-flung body of water flowed at the bottom, winding out of sight in both directions and almost lapping my feet as I stood on the slope. Across the chasm, the wavelets washed the base of the Cyclopean monolith, on whose surface I could now trace both inscriptions and crude sculptures. <laughs> oh god. We well, can look at this monolith. Anything else, though? Oh boy. Alright. Let's have a look at it. The writing was in a system of hieroglyphics unknown to me, and unlike anything I had ever seen in books. I mean, it's just uh, inscriptions of sea creatures, old boy. <laughs> Consisting for the most part of conventionalized aquatic oh, well, symbols there you go. such as fishes, eels, octopi, crustaceans, mollusks, whales, and the like. Several characters obviously represented marine things which are unknown to the modern world. <laughs> Elder gods, all kinds of stuff. But whose decomposing forms I had observed on the ocean risen plain. Or perhaps uh, worshippers of the Elder Things. <laughs> oh, no, well, I shouldn't say Elder Things. Elder Things are actually a very specific thing in uh, Lovecraft's universe. It was the pictorial carving, however, that did most to hold me spellbound. Oh, right. There's a trivia thing there. As that's to move on, let's get the trivia. Storytelling methods. Dagon contains many themes and storytelling methods that Lovecraft developed in his later works, such as telling the story through carvings, aka at the Mountains of Madness or the Nameless of Night, aka, but for example, I should say, at the Mountains of Madness or the Nameless City. Journals and character notes, like The Shadow Out of Time, The Haunter of the Dark, uh, Islands Emerging from the Ocean, The Call of Cthulhu, or fictional beings and deities based on real events and mythologies, such as the Mego in The Whispering Dance. I've read quite a few of those. It's also considered the origin of the popular Cthulhu mythos. Some of Lovecraft's other stories also conclude in a manner similar to Dagon, but let's give the details in order not to spoil the ending. Yes, let's not. Plainly visible across the intervening water, on account of their enormous size, were an array of bas-reliefs whose subjects would have excited the envy of a Doré. I think that these things were supposed to depict men, at least a certain sort of men. <laughs> yeah, not men that as you know them. There is something below them as well that looks uh, slightly ominous, just under that text box. I guess we'll see that in a Though second. The creatures were shown disporting like fishes in the waters of some marine grotto, or paying homage at some monolithic shrine, which appeared to be under the waves as well. Of their faces and forms I dare not speak in detail. Marine people of some kind. Maybe deep ones. 
for the mere remembrance makes me grow faint. Grotesque beyond the imagination of a Poe or a Bulwer. They were damnably human in general outline, despite webbed hands and feet. Shockingly wide and flabby lips. That sounds like a deep one. Glassy, bulging eyes. And other features less pleasant to recall. Yep. Yeah. Go watch my Call of Cthulhu Dark Corners of the Earth playthrough. Deep ones, they're all up in that one. Curiously enough, they seem to have been chiseled badly out of proportion with their scenic background. <laughs> or are they in proportion? <laughs> Is it telling you that they're actually really big and horrible? For one of the creatures was shown in the act of killing a whale, represented as but little larger than himself. Yeah, that's because actually that is the scale, isn't it? I remarked, as I say, their grotesqueness and strange size, but in a moment decided that they were merely the imaginary gods of some primitive fishing or seafaring tribe. No, mate, no. You don't know what you're getting yourself into. Some tribe whose last descendant had perished eras before the first ancestor of the Piltdown or Neanderthal man was born. God, I thought something was going to happen then, but <laughs> all right, he's going to appear. Awestruck at this unexpected glimpse into a past beyond the conception of the most daring anthropologist. He's going to appear at some point. Dagon's going to appear. I stood musing whilst the moon cast queer reflections on the silent channel before me. Then suddenly, oh. I saw it. It's about to happen. With only a slight churning to mark its oh. rise to the surface, the thing slid into view above the dark waters. Time to back up, I think. Ooh! On a famous like and loathsome, it darted like a stupendous monster of nightmares to the monolith, about which it flung its gigantic scaly arms. Oh god, that's loud. It bowed its hideous head and gave vent to certain measured sounds. There's a big boy. I think I went mad then. <laughs> you think? Of my frantic ascent of the slope and cliff, and of my delirious journey back to the stranded boat, I remember little. Yeah, this is exactly like the story. Oh god. Anything else we can look at before we uh, move on? Alright, go. We're fleeing, ladies and gentlemen. Gotta get out of there before Dagon notices us. I believe I sang a great deal, and laughed oddly when I was unable to sing. Yeah, I think your brain has cracked under the strain. Guess we're making our way back to the boat. I have indistinct recollections of a great storm sometime after I reached the boat. At any rate, I know that I heard pearls of thunder and other tones which nature utters only in her wildest moods. Take shelter of the boat, maybe? Oh, no, it's fading out on its own. When I came out of the shadows, I was in a San Francisco hospital. Yeah, that's the thing about Dagon, he wakes up in the hospital. You don't know, technically, did it happen? Brought thither by the captain of the American ship which had picked up my boat in mid-ocean. Dreaming a lot delirious, but free. So yeah, did it happen, or were we just adrift? Was it a, um, a hallucination brought on by the, the sun? In my delirium, I had said much but found that my words had been given scant attention. Oh, God. Of any land upheaval in the Pacific, my rescuers knew nothing. Was it real? <laughs> Nor did I deem it necessary to insist upon a thing which I knew they could not believe. Oh, can we examine the room? Right, well, door. Is there anything else in here? Usually the icons do tend to show up. Ah, see? <laughs> The journalist. Lovecraft was a prominent figure in the world of amateur journalism. In 1915, he started publishing his own journal called The Conservative, which included political and social commentary, poetry, short stories, and literary criticism written by him and other authors. Howard was a skilled wordsmith, that's uh, his first name, uh, but he also took criticisms to heart, which resulted in his decision to step away from writing poetry and concentrate on weird fiction again for the first time since his teenage years. Dagon, published in 1917, was it that early? God, I thought it was 1927 for some reason, uh, is one of the short stories written during that period. In this uh, example excerpt from The Conservative, the master of horror fiction explains his attitude towards warfare and the idea of world peace. 
why any sane human being can believe in the possibility of universal peace is more than the conservative can fathom. Should the entire civilized world agree simultaneously to disarm, one or more nations would undoubtedly retain secret armaments and at the proper time take advantage of their more altruistic and less astute contemporaries in a wild career of conquest against unarmed victims. No country is or ever can be above warfare until the basic impulses of the human animal shall have miraculously changed. I mean, uh, as somebody in field security studies, I want to disagree with that, but I can't bring myself to disagree with it because he's not wrong about that. You know, there is always that fear, that kind of security dilemma in the world, but, you know, that's not what this video is about. We're here about Dagon, ladies and gentlemen. <gasps> and Dagon comes in through the door. <laughs> no, it's not Once what happens. I sought out a celebrated ethnologist and amused him with peculiar questions regarding the ancient Philistine legend of Dagon, the fish god. Mm. Alright, there's something we can look at in here. Just, I'm just looking around. Alright, is that? That's a trivia. Okay. That over there is where we need to go next. Is there anything else in here that we can look at, though? God, I love those graphics, though. So good. It looks so amazing, doesn't it? Alright, let's look at this. Dagon, or Dagan, was the main deity of the Philistines. Uh, worshipped throughout the Middle East as the ancient god of fertility and crops. In Hebrew, the word Dagon was a common noun for grain. The rulers of Akkad, Mesopotamia, that's a really ancient civilization, that is. That's like one of the really old ones, um, along with civilizations like Babylon and Sumer. And, uh, yeah, chose him as the patron saint, a patron saint of their war conquests. He also appeared as the judge of the dead in an Assyrian poem and an underworld prison warder in one of the Babylonian texts. He's often mistakenly taken for a fish god due to the wrong interpretation of his name, as in Hebrew the word dag means fish. In H.P. Lovecraft's works, Dagon is an underwater deity ruling over the deep ones, a humanoid race with fish traits that resides in the oceans. He's worshipped by a secret cult called the Esoteric Order of Dagon. See my Call of Cthulhu Dark Corners of the Earth playthrough. <laughs> or read The Shadow Over Innsmouth, and you'll find out more about them there. Oh boy, and Violent Tune comes in now. Alright, over here. What do we got? But soon perceiving that he was hopelessly conventional, I did not press my inquiries. It's <laughs> one way of putting it. Oh dear sir, you are hopelessly conventional. <laughs> Alright, what are we looking at here? The trivia there. Oh god, that's the Necronomicon. I just read the spine on it. <laughs> oh boy, well we're going to learn more about the Necronomicon in a second. Alright, then we want to go back over there. Alright, show me this. August Derleth and the Cthulhu Mythos. August Derleth was an American writer and anthologist. He also befriended Lovecraft and published many of his works through his company, Arkham House. Although he greatly contributed to the popularization of the author's works after his death, he is surrounded by numerous controversies. One of his most questionable decisions involved introducing the good versus evil doctrine, Derleth was a devout Catholic, to the Cthulhu mythos, which contrasted with Lovecraft's view of the world and his approach to cosmic horror. As a result, the author's works are often misunderstood and misrepresented in today's culture. It's also worth noting that Lovecraft was never really interested in creating a mythology, and the term Cthulhu mythos was coined by Derleth after the author left the mortal plane. Yeah, that's the thing you've got to understand about a lot of Lovecraft's monsters, and like the kind of, well not mon the sort of deities and the, de the kind of creatures of the Cthulhu mythos. They weren't designed to be like intentionally evil, it's more that they're sort of malevolently indifferent to humans, so they are way more powerful than humanity, and could easily destroy it. And so it's just like, more a case of they're not necessarily actively seeking the destruction of humanity, it's just humans can't really comprehend them and so to human eyes they look terrifying and horrible so it's not a straightforward like good or evil kind of thing yes back over here then to the clock oh hello hello what are we looking at here up there oh okay it wants us to go over there oh so why did we come over to the clock then huh Interesting. Don't they know, like, trivia points around? Don't see any. Alright, over to the doors, I'm guessing. Oh, I'm it is back at here. Night, especially when the moon is gibbous and waning, that I see the thing. I tried morphine, but the drug has given only transient surcease and has drawn me into its clutches as a hopeless slave. So now I am to end it all having written a full account for the information 
or the contemptuous amusement of my fellow men. Oh, right, we can do that. Trivia over there. Lovecraft on tobacco and alcohol. Lovecraft hated tobacco, even though he used to smoke when he was 12 in order to look and feel like an adult. In his correspondence with friend Reinhard Kleiner, he claims that he quit as soon as he started wearing long pants. <laughs> it's an interesting time to decide to quit. <laughs> he also had a very strong opinion about alcohol, as evidenced by his letter to Zelia Brown, dated 13th of February 1928. As for the matter of drinking, I have never tasted intoxicating liquor, and never intend to, having a strong aesthetic disgust at anything which blunts or coarsens the delicate natural equipoise of the evolved human intellect and imagination. Drinking excited my personal repugnance, since I don't drink, let the herd do what they will. I am rather in favour of prohibition, the prohibition of any one antisocial force as well as any other. Source, the spirit of revision, Lovecraft's letter to Celia Brown, Reed Bishop, H.P. Lovecraft, Sean uh, Branny and Andrew uh, Lehman, S.T. Joshi. Yes. He was a funny person, H.P. Lovecraft. Often, I ask myself if it could not all have been a pure phantasm. When I say funny, I mean he was a very, I don't know, flawed human being in a lot of respects. Because certainly, you know, there's been a lot of accusations that he was quite, you know, for example, like racist, for example, things like that. And, you know, you do sort of see that coming through in his works. I mean, you do have to obviously have to consider the man in the context of his time, which he was living. But yeah. A mere freak of fever as I lay sun-stricken and raving in the open boat after my escape from the German man of war. This I ask myself, but ever does there come before me a hideously vivid vision in reply. I cannot think of the deep sea without shuddering at the nameless things that may at this very moment be crawling and floundering on its slimy bed. <laughs> Worshipping their ancient stone idols and carving their own detestable oh. likenesses on Hello. obelisks of water-soaked granite. You're a big boy. I dream of a day when they may rise above the billows to drag down into their reeking talons the remnants of puny, war-exhausted mankind. Of a day when the land shall sink and the dark ocean shall ascend amidst universal pandemonium. Oh. Is that how we end it? Oh, <laughs> with uh, the forces of uh, the friggin' preternatural ancient horrors of the universe converging on uh, New York. Oh. The end is near. Oh. I don't like that noise. That don't feel good. I hear a noise at the door as of some immense slippery body lumbering against it. Yeah, I don't think that little dresser table there is going to do you any good. I don't think that's going to hold back anything. All right, well, we have to click that to progress, but let's check there's nothing else. I don't think there is. All right. It shall not find me. Because you're going to throw yourself out the window, aren't you? I think that's what happens. Sorry, spoilers. I should just let it play. I think. I think that's what... Oh. Time to... Yeah, time to get out. God, that hand... Oh, God. Yeah, I see you. It's more like a fucking deep one or something. The window. The window. Yeah, go for the window, mate. Huh? What happens if we just stand here? Will it eventually break through? Can we get <laughs> the alternate ending? <laughs> no, I think we have to click the window by the looks of it. Alright, click the window. Throw yourself out. <laughs> Crunch. Thank you for playing! Achievement unlocked from madness to oblivion. We hope you enjoyed immersing yourself in our little pool of cosmic horror. We'd appreciate it if you took a moment to rate Dagon and check out our other games and DLCs. Well, thank you very much, uh, devs. Uh, I've actually forgotten what the name of your little studio is. That was an interesting little telling. Um, of the Dagon story in the video game form. Quite enjoyed it, you know. There wasn't much to it. It was essentially just point and click, listen to the story as it unfolds. But, you know what? I always love a little uh, Lovecraftian game. And that one was kind of interesting. I liked all the little trivia uh, that you put in there. It was pretty good. So yeah, I hope you uh, all enjoyed this too, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you know, I mean, the thing is, oh God, there's so many Lovecraftian themed games out there that I just want to play. You know, 
there's, there'll be other ones on Steam as well. Um, it's, it probably is worth picking up. I was thinking of uh, what's it called? The one that's on um, EA Origin, um, Sinking City. That's like a big sort of RPG one, which is set in like a kind of town. That I don't think it, I don't think it's set in Innsmouth. I think it's like a town that's sort of inspired a bit by Innsmouth. But yeah, all right. Well, yes. So I hope you enjoyed that, ladies and gents. I enjoyed it. I mean, like I say, there wasn't much to it. But then again, this game's free. You can just get it on Steam. You don't have to pay anything. So, what, do, what more do you want? There you go. So, uh, hope you enjoyed this little Halloween special then. And I uh, hope you'll join me for some uh, more horror games real soon. Face one to the links down below. Along the links to my propagandist channel for anyone interested. And if you enjoyed, do not forget leave a like, comment, subscribe, and all that jazz. Or maybe Dagon will come and haunt you in your sleep. Goodbye. What's the What's the plan? Ooh. Get to the lifeboats at the rear. Oh shit. Right, we have to avoid the attack again, don't we? Oh god, he's there. Okay. Let's wait for him. Lasers. Remember, hold down E to use health backs. Shit, how do I get down? Ooh! No, you dare. Shit. Where do I get down? How do I get down? Shit. No, no doors opening. Oh, there. There, 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 there. Fuck. Let me in. How's my health? Oh, not too bad, actually. Let me just recharge a little bit. Whoa. Okay, it can blast you through the door. That's not good. Actually, it didn't do too much damage there, did it? Yeah. Guys, people, where are you? Where's the dude who was up here before?